We're going to be looking at uh, the first eight verses today in Hebrews 13. At the top of my Bible, there's sort of a title. It's not actually scripture, but just the title at the top of 13. It says, Concluding Exhortations. And uh, there's um, seven of these exhortations. An exhortation, uh, the writer here is advocating for us living into our faith. Exhortation is an emphatic urging for you to do something. So today we're going to talk about these seven exhortations. All seven apply to all of us. You might resonate more with one or two of these seven, but all seven of these apply to all of us. These are emphatic urgings for us to do something. All of these exhortations are going to sit on this foundation of Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So here are the seven exhortations. First is to love one another. Practice hospitality. Remember the imprisoned and those who are suffering. Fourthly, honor marriage. Be content. Do not fear. And the seventh is remember your leaders. So again, all of this is for all of us. I just want to invite all of us to lean into these exhortations. We'll look at these one at a time. The first is love one another. There's an exhortation here to love one another, and then there's clarity as what it looks like to love one another. So verse 1, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. You might remember that these new converts to Christianity, these, these new converts were beginning to slip back. Uh, they were beginning, we used the term backsliding in the church where I grew up. These guys were slipping back into their old forms of Judaism, into their old forms of religion. Their love and devotion was beginning to waver. One of the first indicators that love for Jesus is wavering is a diminishing love for one another. You might remember these verses from Hebrews chapter 10. We read them a couple of weeks ago. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Their love for one another was wavering. They're not stirring one another up. They're not encouraging one another. In fact, they're not even meeting together anymore. They're neglecting each other. The call to love our brothers and sisters is not predicated on how they love us. In fact, the pathway to holiness is choosing to love and then to love and to love again even when your love or my love is refused or rejected. The exhortation here is for you and me to love others as Christ has loved you. Love one another. Second exhortation is to practice hospitality. Verse 2 tells us how. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. So the word hospitality literally means loving strangers. Loving strangers is a concrete expression of Christian love loving strangers there's this really crazy story in genesis 18 you don't have to turn there but maybe later you can read genesis 18 it's this story about abraham's love of strangers these three strangers show up and they just kind of appear out of nowhere and he's like what's going on and they have this quick interaction and abraham calls his wife sarah and is like hey make a big meal let's make a big meal for these strangers they've come to us you can read all about it the whole thing is amazing uh, they're actually rewarded abraham and sarah are actually a rewarded for their expression of love to strangers. The readers of this letter, the very first readers would know that story. And then there's this whole thing about loving strangers. You might actually entertain an angel. Anyone here ever entertained an angel? Ah, uh, this word angel means messenger. So in some sense, as we entertain Someone who brings a message from God, uh, we are entertaining an angel. 
in the sense of entertaining a spirit who comes to us in human form with a message from God, perhaps some will have that privilege even today. The third exhortation is to remember the imprisoned and those suffering. Verse 3, remember those who are in prison and those and though in prison with them and those who are mistreated since you also are in the body. Remember those in prison as though you were in prison with them. That's crazy, as those who are in the body. You might remember these first readers were being persecuted. We've talked a little bit about this, but just real quick, back to chapter 10 for just a moment. The writer says these words, Remember those earlier days after you'd received the light, when you endured in great conflict, full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and you joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So don't throw away your confidence for it will be richly rewarded. He's saying it again. Don't forget the imprisoned. Don't forget the suffering. Don't forget the marginalized. Paul writes something similar to the church at Corinth. And when he's speaking about the body of Christ, Paul writes these words, 1 Corinthians 12, 26, if one part of the body suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part of the body is honored, every part rejoices with it. In his letter from the Birmingham jail, Martin Luther King Jr. wrote these words, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Y'all, there are many in our body right now who are mourning. There are many who are grieving and suffering. There are many, not many, there are a couple in our body that are in prison. The scriptures are not calling us to be codependent, but rather exhorting us to be interdependent in the tapestry of mutual love and concern, suffering with and suffering for one another. That's the call to action in the exhortation. Fourthly, the exhortation is to honor marriage. Again, this is for all of us, whether you're married or single or divorced, this exhortation is for all of us to honor marriage. Verse 4, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. So three things, real quick. Marriage, the marriage bed, and just a word about sexual immorality. So lots of discourse, lots, lots of dialogue in the world, and especially in the church about marriage, about who should be married, about who gets to marry people. Churches and denominations are dividing over this issue of marriage. And like many of you, I'm confronted with these questions. I'm confronted with these issues. And in trying to find resolve in this issue, as with any issue I face, I'm going to always start with Jesus. What did Jesus say? What did Jesus do? How did Jesus love? How did Jesus pray? Well, here's a glimpse of what Jesus said about marriage. Uh, from Matthew's gospel, Jesus actually goes all the way back. He goes all the way back and quotes Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Jesus says these words, Haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason, a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and the two become one flesh. Jesus is making it really, really clear. Marriage is God's idea from the beginning, and it is reserved for the union of a man and a woman. About adultery, Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said, Do not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And with as much strength and authority as he says these things, he shows just as much compassion to those who sin. To the woman caught in the act of adultery, Jesus says these words, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. 
just a word about the marriage bed keep the marriage bed pure uh, when we were going through pre premarital counseling uh, we got to the topic of sex and i was super excited about the topic of sex <laughs> and we were giving this counsel you can do whatever you want as long it is as long as it is agreed to by both partners this is not the kind of direction that a 20 year old craig bowler needs to hear <laughs> this is exactly what i wanted to hear but this is terrible counsel we quickly reversed our course and made the commitment that whatever happens in our bed will honor God. The starting point in all of sexuality is how does it honor God? Not what our feelings are, not what we think. How does our sexuality expressed honor God? God is the creator of this incredible gift called sexuality, and when we honor God together, there could be no greater gift given to me or to us and no greater gift for us to offer back to God than to honor our marriage bed. Now, we've been married for 34 years. And believe it or not, we're still trying to figure it out. Anybody been married 34 years and have this whole thing figured out? I'd like to talk with you afterwards because we're still working it out. But I want to just tell you a couple of things that we've committed to in order to honor our marriage bed our bed has been the place of the greatest form of intimacy, prayer. It's where we pray. It's where we've prayed for our kids. It's where we've prayed for their friends. It's where we've prayed with our granddaughter. Our marriage bed is a place of prayer. Our marriage bed is a place of peace. We've committed to never argue in bed. It's going to be a place of peace. It's a place of blessing. We've committed to never go to bed angry. We take literally the words to the church that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, don't let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. We don't resolve everything. We don't get it all figured out. We've just made the commitment that we're not going to argue in bed and we're not going to go to bed angry. Our marriage bed is a place of joy, love expressed physically and intimately for mutual pleasure and joy, not to be given as a reward and not to be withheld as punishment. And lastly, our marriage bed, to honor our marriage bed, it's just a place of rest. We don't have a television in our room. We don't bring our phones to bed. It is a sacred space. It's a place of rest. The fifth exhortation is to be content. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. I love this. The writer's quoting Deuteronomy 31, 6. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Contentment. References money. Money is not bad in and of itself, but I want you to make sure you notice the language here. It doesn't say stay away from money. It says be free from the love of money. Money can do crazy things to people. It does crazy things to me. I don't know if you know this, but I don't know who gives here. I don't know like the names of who gives or who doesn't give. I don't know how much money people give. I've never known. I don't want to know. Money does weird things to me. So I just don't want to know that kind of stuff. I just want to know that we're giving. That's what I want to know. I want to know what we're giving. Paul writes the same thing to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Money can do that. The writer is saying, be content. Tim Keller in his book, Counterfeit God, says, Jesus warns people far more often about greed than about sex. Yet almost no one thinks they're guilty of it. Therefore, we should all begin with the hypothesis that this could easily be a problem for me. The biggest threat to contentment is comparison. The moment we start comparing ourselves to one another, we begin this journey of discontentment. 
The exhortation is to be content. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. God's got us, and we can trust him. The next exhortation is really similar. It says, do not fear. Uh, the Lord is our helper. Do not fear. The writer quotes Psalm uh, 118, 6 and 7. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do? Love this. The Lord is our helper. We don't need to be afraid. Classic passage. Most of you probably know by heart. Psalm 23, 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Isaiah 41, verse 10. So do not fear, for I am, do not be dismayed, for I am your God, and I will strengthen you and help you. I'll help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. There's just one other passage of scripture I want to share with you just really quickly. It's this crazy story in the Old Testament about battle. There's always battles going on in the Old Testament. Um, there's this battle going on in 2 Chronicles chapter 14 between the Cushites and the Israelites. And the Israelites are outnumbered. The Cushites coming at them. And uh, Asa, the Israelite guy, says, man, we need some help, Lord. We need some help. Here's, this, here's just a, a, a glimpse of the story from 2 Chronicles chapter 14. Uh, starting at verse 9 and, and uh, down through verse 11. Zerah the Cushite marched out against them, out against the Israelites, with an army of thousands upon thousands, and 300 chariots, and came as far as Mershah. Asa went out to meet him, and they took up battle positions in the valley of Zephthah near Mershah. Then Asa calls to the Lord his God and said, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. So help us, Lord, our God, for we rely on you, and in your name we have come against this vast army. Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere mortals prevail against you. I love that. Asa knows that he's outnumbered. He knows that uh, this is not just about his name. This, he knows it's not just about his country or about his reputation. This is about God's reputation. These are God's chosen people. And he goes, God, it doesn't make any difference to you if there's just a handful of us against this army of thousands upon thousands, but we need your help. We need your help. We don't have any power. You've got it all. And so we trust you. We trust you. And it's in your name that we're going out against these guys. Don't let your name get defiled. We're with you. We're on your side. And we know that you're with us. The Lord is with me. I will not fear what man is going to do to me. The Lord is my helper, and he's my strength. Paul writes these words to the church at Rome. If God is for us, who can be against us? The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man might do. Jesus is about to go to the cross, and he prays, uh, he's preparing his disciples just before he prays for them. He says to them, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be with you. Another name for the Holy Spirit is the helper. So let me just ask a quick question. Anyone here today need help? There's one hand. I see that hand. Two hands. A couple hands. Anyone need help? Heck yeah, we bowlers need help. Anyone? Anyone feel powerless or overwhelmed or discouraged? Or maybe like Asa, you sense that you're fighting against something so big, it's way bigger than you, and you don't have any fight left, and you're looking at this army, and you're just going, I just can't do it anymore. I can't do it anymore, Lord. I need your help. If that's you, let me just encourage you. God is for you. He is not against you. God is with you, Jesus said, and the Spirit lives in you. God has not forgotten about you. He's not lost track of you. Ultimately, God's love will prevail. I don't know what that's going to look like, not promising you health or wealth or even happiness. Just in the end, his love will prevail. And in that truth, we can find rest. The last exhortation is to remember. 
calls us to action. And so the action here is to remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you and consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. We looked at this chapter as a staff a couple weeks ago in our staff meeting. Troy Gambrell, uh, our pastor with students, pulled out this verse. We kind of were saying, hey, what verse speaks to you in this chapter? And Troy said, this verse speaks to me. And he talked a little bit about his experience growing up in the church. He talked about his youth pastors and how influential they were in his life. And then he talked about when he was an intern, he was working for some guys who... Uh, we're leading the church, and he said, it's just amazing how what they taught at church, the same thing that they lived at home. What they taught and what they were all about with their faith family, they lived with their own family. And he was talking about how encouraging it was and how he was encouraged by that example, this example of faith. Earlier this week, I got to hang out with a college freshman who grew up around here in our church. And we were talking about how she wound up here at Sanctuary. And she was telling me that she was teaching ballet when she was in eighth grade, or dance when she was in eighth grade over at Burnt Hickory. And this family came in, and this family had these two daughters, and the older daughter was learning dance, and she was getting to teach this older daughter dance. And she said, every time the dad came in, he was just this really cool guy, and I was just kind of drawn to this guy. She said, about that time, I was looking for a different church, and I ended up at Sanctuary. Not sure how I ended up here, but when I walked in the back doors, that dad was standing on this stage. That dad was Troy Gambrell. And she said, I didn't know that it, he was that guy. He was that dad that I was so impressed with at ballet, at dance in eighth grade. And we went on to have this cool conversation that after she spent all of her high school years here, that just in a couple weeks, the Sunday after Thanksgiving, Troy is going to baptize Janelle Reese right back there. Janelle, a little shout out to you. Wave, wave for everybody. There's Janelle. Janelle's going to get baptized in a couple weeks. Our faith being, uh, our faith just being lived out while we drop our kids off at dance class or take them to school or run to soccer practice or wherever we find ourselves, who knows what kind of impact they're going to have on the lives of others. And who knows, but that you and me might get the chance to be that person of influence and one day see that person come to Christ and be baptized. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Our triune God does not change. God spoke through the prophet Malachi. He said, for I, the Lord your God, do not change. Therefore, you, O children, of Jacob, you are not consumed. <laughs> this is really good news for us. God does not, his character does not change. Circumstances may change. There are times in the Bible where God changes his mind, but never his character. When John the Beloved writes, God is love, that is talking about his character. It means that God's love cannot be changed. God can't be anything but love. God can't stop loving because that's the core of his being. When John the Beloved writes God is love, it's because he knows this love. He's experienced this love. God is love. That means there's nothing that you can do to make God love you more, and there's nothing that you can do to make God love you less. God's love doesn't change, and God's love will prevail. But we change, and we grow, and a lot of us, over time, have fallen more deeply in love with God as we've grown and changed. I'm not sure what it's like for you guys as parents, but many of you uh, feel the same way about your kids. as I, Those of you that I've talked to, I'm sure all of you feel the same way about your kids as I feel about my kids. But my love for my kids just continues to grow. I didn't think that when I held my baby the very first time, Adele, when she... When I, I, I just thought, there's no way I could feel any more love than what I feel in this moment right now. But can I just say this? 28 years later, my love for that kid has only grown. It's only increased. I could talk all day long, and I would just get started about how much I love that kid. And then all of a sudden, seven years later, this Chinese kid is handed to us and says, here's your kid. I'm telling you, in that moment, I could have never loved that kid. I mean, more than I, I couldn't even express. All I could do is just cry 
I love that kid so much when she was handed to us. But can I just tell you, 21 years later, I love that kid more than I could ever be. We could talk all day long, and I would just be getting started. My love for her has grown and grown and grown and grown. God's love never changes, but our love can change. Our love can grow. I'm changing. I'm growing. One of the ways that I've changed and grown is my picture of God. God is a lot bigger. (laughs) He's a lot bigger and much more beautiful and more kind and more tender and more compassionate and more powerful and more loving than ever before. I just try to illustrate this real quick. I was trying to think, like, how could I illustrate this? I'm just going to illustrate it real quick. I was reading to my uh, granddaughter, Lennon, a little bit of C.S. Lewis, uh, Prince Caspian. Anybody uh, know the Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe series? Prince Caspian is amazing. Um, she's one. She got the whole thing. She got everything that I was reading here. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> she was asleep. <laughs> but it's never too early. It's never too early. That in Prince Caspian, there's this part in the story where Lucy is seeing Aslan for the first time, or hasn't seen Aslan for a long time, and is seeing Aslan again. And uh, Lucy is like this main character. Aslan is the lion, sort of the Christ character. The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe series is an allegory, and so the Aslan character represents Jesus. If you haven't read it, buy yourself a Christmas gift. Read the whole thing. It's amazing. Well, anyway, this story, this, this part of the story is when Lucy... Uh, sees Aslan, and she kind of falls into him, and she tries to wrap her arms around him, but her, he's so big, her arms only look like part way. And Aslan says to her, he says, welcome, child, he says. <laughs> Aslan, said Lucy, you're bigger. That's, that's because you are older, little one, answered he. Not because you are. I am not. (laughs) But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. Anybody ever heard of this verse, John 3, 16? Anybody ever heard that one? You might not have heard of all this crazy stuff, but anybody ever heard John 3, 16? Do you guys know that one? You probably, if you grew up around the church, you probably know that one from when you were little. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then the next verse, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. I see this truth in John 3, 16 and 17 bigger than I've ever seen it before. Like he loves the whole world, not just Kennesaw. Did you guys know that? He loves the entire world, not just Cobb County, not just Georgia. Do you guys know that? Not just the Southeast. Like, he loves the whole world. He loves the whole— When it says the whole world, it means the whole world. And when it says whoever, it literally means whoever. Not who we think is okay to enter into the kingdom, but whosoever will. When I'm reading this stuff, it's so much bigger than I've ever read it before. And condemnation, by the way, condemnation was never a part of his character. And it's never a part of his character now, nor we. Will it be one day? Condemnation is never a part of his story. His story is to save. It 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 is to save save you and me and the world. And who does he want to use to do that? You and me. I got a lot that I'd like to say about this. I could talk all day long about this. Our world is crazy. But Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. Fullerton Dale, who led us in our call to worship, I'm going to give Fullerton Dale the last word in this message. So check out his video. Today, Craig has asked me the question, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How does this truth encourage you? The truth to me is that Jesus will never let me down. He will always be there for me, always love me, and always care for me. I don't need to worry about him changing or stopping what he's doing. I don't have to think about, is he going to be there one day and not the next? Because he will always be there throughout. Let's pray. God, thank you that we don't have to worry. 
whether you're going to be with us one day or the next. Thank you that we can rest in the confidence that you have done it, you are doing it, and you will prevail. God, we give you praise. We give you praise. In Jesus' name.